Welcome everyone to AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday, part of AURI Connects monthly online series featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. I'm Dan Scogan, the AURI Director of Government and Industry Relations, and your host on Webinar Wednesdays. The AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. This program aims to actively engage all participants in the food and ag industry to improve competitiveness of producers, businesses, and entrepreneurs through ongoing, purposeful connection of resources and partners along the value chain, and increase knowledge of opportunities, technologies, and trends. Remember, this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at auri.org. Remember also that you will be muted during our presentations, but you can send us your written questions through the Q&A portal on your screen. Well, as we all know, there has been a seismic shift in how consumers discover, experience, and purchase food products. Industry analysts estimate that nearly 20% of all global retail sales will occur online this year. This can be intimidating and overwhelming for food and beverage businesses. That is why AURI and Clutch Performance collaborated to publish the Demystifying Digital Marketing and E-Commerce for Food Businesses Toolkit. Today, Jason Robinson, AURI Business Development Director for Food at AURI, will lead our discussion. Jason works with food clients to develop their businesses to further the value-added development of Minnesota's agricultural products. And prior to joining AURI, Jason spent 19 years in corporate research and development at a Fortune 500 food manufacturer as a product and process developer across a number of food technologies, including ready-to-eat cereal, salty snacks, frozen dough, ice cream, tortillas, taco shells, and snack bars. For the U.S., Canada, and other global businesses in both the conventional and natural product sectors. So with that, Jason Robinson and panelists, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Thanks so much for your time, Dan, and thanks for that great intro. I'm going to start today by just giving a brief background on uh, the purpose of this project work and then kicking it off to the stars of the show. Um, this project work was funded in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and AURI's Competitive Agricultural Innovation Partnership Program. This program is meant to catalyze innovation, generate new ideas, and support partnerships in value-added agricultural spaces. Every year, AURI puts forth several challenges to solicit work on innovation and creating long-term economic impact in areas that we consider dormant. For this particular project, our motivation was built around the observation that the COVID-19 pandemic forever changed how consumers discover new products and make purchases. Every day, more and more consumers are spending a significant part of their weekly grocery budget online. As a result, it's crucial for food and beverage businesses to develop an effective and coherent digital presence and online shopping platform. Dave Miller from Clutch Performance will dive into significantly more detail, but briefly, AURI and Clutch developed an online learning module to help business owners get smarter and create a baseline of knowledge that would accelerate their learning curve to make better decisions and grow their revenue faster by providing answers and focusing on three key questions that each business may have. One, how do businesses best connect with consumers in a digital space? Two, how do businesses then convert that connection into relevant sales? And then three, and finally, once that sale is complete, how do those businesses deal with the logistics of getting that product to the end consumer? We'll, we'll, uh, we'll dive into more of the details of this module here in a minute, but first, let me introduce our panelists and speakers today. First, Dave Miller is the Vice President of Food Businesses at Clutch Performance, a local agency providing business acceleration support for agri-food businesses. Clutch and AURI collaborate regularly to provide local food entrepreneurs with tools and baseline knowledge 
to improve their likelihood of success. And today, will walk us through the highlights of this newest learning module. Jessica Waller is the CEO and co-founder of Humble Nut Butter, a local Minnesota startup focused on providing an artisan, handmade, savory nut butter experience to their consumer. Jessica will share some of Humble Nut Butter's experiences, both as a startup organization and in online commerce, particularly as a startup company. And then finally, Brian Erickson is the new markets program manager at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. He's a well-known friend and supporter of the local food ecosystem, providing both marketing guidance and cost sharing support through a number of different programs at the Department of Ag. And will today share details of those programs to support development and growth of e-commerce for local Minnesota food businesses. So with that, I will turn it over to Jessica Waller Jessica, please uh, tell us a little bit about Humble Nut Butter and your experiences with e-commerce. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. So I'm Jessica Waller. I am half of a two-person team along with my husband, John Waller. We founded Humble Nut Butter about three years ago um, and started out really just with an idea that why are all nut butters plain or sweet when we really like savory flavors? And we kind of expanded on that idea by taking some of our favorite nuts, combining it with really savory herbs and spices, and created three distinct flavored nut butters, sun-dried basil cashew, truffle herb walnut, and turmeric maple pecan, and got out into the farmer's markets in the Twin Cities area to see how, you know, people who don't know us would respond and would people actually buy it and um, all of those good things. So given that we weren't in any brick and mortar stores at that time, having a website was a way for us to communicate with our customers, um, provide people a place that they could go to learn about it if maybe they happened to see the product at the farmer's market but didn't buy it there or if they're at somebody's house and they got that product at the farmer's market, there was a way that people could find us online. So it was a really great, easy way now to be able to communicate with people. So, you know, I'll get into the tech and what platforms we use, but even somebody, it, it can seem very intimidating, but I think there's so many great tools out there that any business really should and can have a website. Um, you don't have to have coding experience or anything like that, the, the platforms make it really, really easy to have it happen. And I think for me personally, it just was really important that we have an online space for people to find us just for validity and professionalism that we're a brand that's, you know, we're, we're not just going to um, be something that's fly by night or gone tomorrow that we're really putting our foot down and putting ourselves out there. Um, one thing I will say in conjunction with websites is just to touch on URLs. There's a lot of different places where you can purchase URLs. Um, I would also suggest just from my experience, potentially purchasing other, depending on your business name, if it's possible for you to purchase other URLs that are like sounding. So if people were to put an S on the end of something and not find your website, then you can redirect that URL to your, to your main landing page. Just a little tip there. Um, for content, again, it really allowed us to tell our story. So we're a woman-owned business. We're also an inclusive employer. We currently co manufacture ourselves in Golden Valley in a commercial kitchen that's located within a apartment complex that's designated for adults with developmental and physical disabilities. And through the process of finding the commercial kitchen, we were introduced to an organization who would pair adults with disabilities with com companies. And given that there's just John and I, and it's a very labor intensive business, we can use any extra hands we can get. So our only other employee is Tim, and um, he's a resident here at 
at the um, Cornerstone Creek, which is the apartment complex, and he helps us with labeling. So as you can see on the picture, there's a front label and a back label. So he helps us with that. He also helps us prepare our online orders and things of that nature. So again, the website's a great place to kind of tell our story about, you know, just the little bit behind the business um, and explain the product. We have a very differentiated product. People are have a inherent kind of, you know, picture in their mind of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So to be able to visually display and explain how people can use our product, show recipes, things of that nature is really, really important for our, our brand. And I will say, if you go to our website, there's a lot of pages now. Three years ago, it was like four pages. So it's one of those things where you don't have to have a fully you know, curated website with lots of different pages and links to go to. It's something that kind of grows over time. Um, and we wanted to have a way for people to purchase our product when we weren't at farmer's markets. Um, and we did that through the platform that, that we're currently using. Um, the other thing I'll say about content is for us, we're always trying to generate new content. I think it's a constant, you know, that's one of the busiest things about the business is generating new content for the website, for social, um, to share. Video is really, really important right now. So we try and do the best we can to kind of get mileage out of things. And um, so having visual pictures that are somewhat evergreen in terms of their seasonality, and things of that nature that we can repurpose and reuse to continue to talk to our consumers is really important for us. Um, we definitely see more of a connection to our consumer base on Instagram. So we, you'll see a lot of tie-in potentially on our particular website between our Instagram account and our website driving traffic there. And then that's how we kind of have grown our audience and are able to talk to them through other digital channels like email. Um, we use something called Lately Social to kind of help us manage and plan out some of our things. There's, I believe, in the module, which is really, really nicely put together and organized. It gives some examples of Hootsuite and other things. So there's lots of different tools out there that you can definitely use. Um, and in terms of tech, we, our website is built on Squarespace. Um, we are in the process of a brand refresh. So we were, we'll, we'll be moving all of our content to a new website. And when we do that, I think we're gonna do that with Wix because on Wix, you can use Shopify, which is just a more robust um, interface for shipping and fulfillment you get more data. Um, so we'll be making that shift. But I think whether you choose Wix or Squarespace, I would just say do whatever you feel most comfortable with, whatever platform you like better. Um, another um, platform we use is MailChimp. And MailChimp is nice because it integrates with our, I, I'm sure it integrates with Wix. It does integrate with Squarespace. So when anybody makes a purchase online or signs up for our, our email list, they automatically get into MailChimp. So and a welcome email is automatically generated and an email message is automatically generated when someone places a purchase and things like that. We also use ShipStation, which is really nice because whenever, whenever anyone makes a purchase on our website, it goes into ShipStation and will generate um, the shipping label we need depending on what their order is. All of these things cost a lot of money. Um, so it's really great. Ari has a cost share program. And I think Brian can talk more about that. It's been really important for us. We're a scrappy two-person team. So every penny counts. And to and online shopping over the past year has been more important than ever. We are in brick and mortar stores right now, but um, online is is if you think of it like a three-legged chair, you know, a stool, you can't, you need, you need those three legs. So regardless of what happens in the future, I, I don't want to give up on um, brick and mortar retail, but online orders will be, 
will continue to be a huge part of our business. Um, and I'll talk about more with that later. Um, and just in terms of tech, even though this isn't a tech, I'm gonna give a, two plugs to some local partners who have helped us a lot. Um, when I spoke about generating content, and Dave, I think I saw you nod your head <laughs> that you're always trying to generate new content. Um, Suna is a great resource in the Twin Cities. They are a kind of a photographer on demand. Um, we worked with them mid-pandemic. We dropped product off in their offices in downtown Minneapolis. You schedule a time and you have a live chat with the photographer and you're seeing photos come through as they take them. You can give them feedback and say, I want this here. I want, you know, closer, further away. The, they do everything from complete white background shots that you need for products for, you know, selling on an online retailer. Most online retailers require you to have really high quality photos in a completely white background, but they also do lifestyle type shoots. So, you, and they do some video and gifts and things like that too. So they're a great resource because they're really quick and they're on demand. And I, I just think they have a really great model. Um, another plug I will do is for Fresh Coast Collective. Fresh Coast Collective is a marketing and photography agency in the Twin Cities. So they've done a lot of our lifestyle um, photography, pretty much a lot of our um, photos for recipes have been done by Fresh Coast Collective. Um, so those are a couple plugs I will give um, there. How are we doing on time? We good? I'll just keep rolling. All right, so um, kind of next in that module is a marketing section and social is a, a big part of marketing and social is a full-time job to constantly generate that content, stay on top of people's feeds. And then when it comes to Instagram, you have your stories and your posts. And so um, another really effective way that we found to build our social media audience and also our email audience is through um, co-branding and giveaways. Um, last year when the state fair was canceled, we did a partnership um, with Peace Coffee, where we were, I think, one of four different brands that was in a, like a giveaway basket, it was called No Fair Giveaway Basket, and that was um, promoted heavily online, but you had to fill out a form on Peace's website, and through that co-branding effort, we really, there was a lot of people that built our list. One thing I will say about co-branding efforts of that nature I personally like a secondary opt-in email. So when people are doing giveaways and sweepstakes and things of that nature, they don't always think about signing up for Humble Nut Butter's website. They were just entering in a giveaway. So I did a secondary opt-in email to that group saying, thank you for participating in the No Fair giveaway. We're so excited to have you here. If you don't want to receive any more messages from us, please click this link here. So I think that helped mitigate like the huge flood of unsubscribes you would get and being clicked as spam, which can impact your deliverability rates um, for people. So that's just kind of a personal experience I've had with giveaways. Um, through promoted through social, but I think it's a really great way to help build your following in your lists. Um, podcasts are also becoming a really big thing. We've had the um, benefit of being part of a couple different podcasts in the Twin Cities that have been really helpful based around food. Um, there's also just like the food boroughs and Grow North and I'm in a group called Women Who Really Cook. So all of those networking groups is just a really good way to help market your, your business throughout the community. Um, I think print too, even though um, isn't really mentioned much, but it everything, everything it's like a 
puzzle piece. Um, and events. I think events was really one of the main reasons why we started our website was to be able to tell people what farmer's market we would be at on what day and what time. Um, and we've continued to do kind of like little events through um, there's something called pop-up grocery that we've done an event at in New York and LA and neighborhood goods had an event that we were part of in Austin, Texas. So it's another way to just kind of continue to grow, especially grow our following outside of the Twin Cities area since all of our brick and mortar retail is local. Um, for e-commerce, you can buy direct through our website. Um, our biggest e-commerce channel is Amazon. Um, we have a storefront. In order to have a storefront, you have to have your own trademarked brand, I believe. So we own the trademark to Humble Nut Butter. So we are able to have a Humble Nut Butter storefront, um, which I think is helpful because you'll get a lot of people like selling things third party on Amazon. So it's nice to have that storefront to kind of stake your claim and have people know that the product that they're purchasing is coming directly from you. Um, Amazon is a beast. We are fulfilled by Amazon. We use a um, company called Voyager Group who was recommended to us through a fellow food entrepreneur friend. And they really help us manage our online spend. And it's all about getting on the first page and capturing those eyeballs and, and driving sales. So um, I don't know how we would have done it without Voyager Group, but um, I'm sure they have lots of tutorials. Um, they have lots of tools. I would um, encourage people to use the tool that they have to determine if it's going to be financially better for you to be um, fulfilled by merchant or fulfilled by Amazon. Um, also, just be very mindful that they are very strict about um, their labeling and everything. So I've heard horror stories of people, you know, sending product without it being labeled, and then you get charged for all of the things that Amazon ends up having to do on their end. So we do as much as we can. We box all of our individual, um, we sell individual jars, two pack jars, and then three packs. Um, so we package all of that up. And then we typically have one day of, at the end of the week where we ship all of our Amazon um, fulfillment to, to their various warehouses. We also are on a third party website called Bubble. Their URL is bubblegoods.com, I believe. Um, and they've been a pretty good, <coughs> excuse me, they've been a really good partner for us. Um, I think it's a different audience than Amazon, um, but it's it's been good for us. And um, we're also on fair.com. It's F-A-I-R-E.com. And fair.com is a marketplace for smaller boutiques to kind of find different products. So through fair.com, we've gotten into a boutique up in Cuyuna Lakes, and then there's one in Philadelphia and a place in Boca Raton that we're in. We're in a place in Telluride and a new marketplace um, in Chicago, and they all use fair.com. So it's just a really um, user-friendly way to have different stores that are outside of our area find us, per make those orders, and um, for us to manage it so it's we're not getting inundated by lots of different um, one-off orders. Um, and then the other e-commerce category that I have in my notes is Instacart. So <laughs> we are sold um, at various co-ops around the city. And so Instacart and just making sure that the retailers that you're in have pictures. So when if somebody's doing Instacart, which a lot of people are doing Instacart now instead of in-person shopping, that they can find your product the same way they would if they were walking the aisles. And sometimes you just have to make sure and look and and, and get on, on their visual offerings. The other thing I'll say about Amazon um, is their link now with Whole Foods Market. We are in the seven Whole Foods locations here in Minnesota and we're looking to expand. And we have heard that um, there is an expectation that 
if you're going to be in Whole Foods that you're also selling on Amazon, which I thought was interesting. So um, not a ton of connection between Whole Foods and Amazon from my perspective thus far, but um, good to know that we're already on the platform. Right, well, thank you for your time, Jessica. I really appreciate your perspective. Yeah. Um, with that, I think we will move into Dave Miller from Clutch, who will walk us through a little bit on this uh, tool that AURI and Clutch has collaborated on. Thanks again, Jess. Yeah. Dave, on to yeah. you. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, again, it was a great uh, project to be part of, and uh, we've done a couple of these, so it's, it's been fun to kind of build a portfolio of these uh, activities. Real quickly about Clutch and Jason introduced uh, a little earlier. We work in both the agriculture and food space, helping folks grow their business. A um, little bit of a hybrid between a consultancy and a, uh, a traditional ad agency. Um, and I think what makes us a little bit different than that typical ad agency is most of ourselves, uh, our senior leaders like myself, we all have industry background. So I've been with Clutch since, uh, really since the inception, a um, couple months after we kind of kicked the thing off. And, uh, but prior to that, I've got 20 years of background in CPG marketing here in uh, several companies in Minneapolis. And so um, I always come to these projects with a little bit of a, a little bit of a perspective for kind of what the end game looks like from a scaling perspective, having worked in already scaled businesses, but uh, hopefully enough knowledge to kind of help folks move along the, move along the path. Um, Jason, why don't we hop to the next slide? So again, a little bit from the, the project background, um, you know, just a couple of things that are sort of guiding it. You know, at first, it is really this increase in online, uh, online commerce. So we've talked about it already, right? I think one of the things we quoted in the document was, you know, height of pandemic last year, June, July, 29% of volume was being bought online. Food volume was being bought online instead of 10% uh, a year prior. You know, I think the reality is we were all driven there for a very specific reason, but that, you know, the sort of the core benefit of convenience of shopping online isn't going to go away. And as folks sort of maybe got forced into that experience, um, they're going to have that opportunity to, to keep doing that. And, and so will the number retreat? Yes, but will it retreat to 10%? I don't think it will. Um, this project builds on a portfolio of guides that we've already uh, uh, completed and are on the AURI website. Uh, Clutch, we've done one on uh, packaging and on uh, shelf life for scaling businesses. Um, there are a couple other guides on the on the site uh, array around pricing and um, uh, and food safety. Um, at the end of the day, all of these are about you know not necessarily giving all the answers because I think everyone's path is different, but it's about identifying some of the questions and topics and and sort of answering that first level question. And um, one of the things that the online format that we have here kind of did um, somewhat uniquely versus uh, other guides that we've done was, you know, the, the copy we wrote is kind of the 101. It gave us the opportunity to add a lot of links into other best practice documents that um, the user can get into um, sort of next level stuff and finding more information um, on any given topic. And so um, kind of gets bigger than itself pretty quickly. We do have a PDF version uh, that we'll deliver to, a to AURI here uh, mid-month so that there's a, a little bit of a downloadable document to this thing um, beyond just the online format. Um, the other piece of the online format, and Jason, we can hop to the next slide, that's kind of nice is just this idea that um, as things change in this world uh, digitally, which things are rapidly moving, uh, it'll give AURI and ourselves a chance to go back in, say, every year and, and update things as, uh, as big changes happen. So in terms of getting to the guide, if you're looking for it, two spots to get to it. First, it is at aurdigitalmarketing.org, and that'll bring you directly there. Uh, the other is to navigate through the AURI website. If you're familiar with going into the focus areas uh, within the website, uh, underneath food, there are a number of guides, and this is one of the guides listed um, listed there. So let's hop onto the next slide, and we'll just we'll kind of move quickly from that. This, just so you can see it, first time you get there, you'll know that you're there because this is what the homepage looks like. Um, it's essentially kind of an ebook format, and the navigation on the left will let you know as you scroll down and move from page to page, kind of where you're sitting in any one of the um, any one of the spots in the in the document. So, um, with that, let's hop into the next page, and I'll highlight a little bit of the content that we covered. Um, probably won't go real deep, just because there's a lot of stuff there. So consider this the, the flyby of of knowing what the content is within the document, and a couple of highlights that um, I think are important for folks to think about. You know, the first thing and why the, the format actually works really well is that 
right? This whole online world is a little bit of a matrix unto itself. I think intuitively people tend to start in the center there with their website and thinking about what does that website want to be? You know, we talk a little bit about that as well as, you know, you've got to think about hosting it. Where's the domain? You know, what's your domain? Where are you hosting the website? What's that service like? Um, you got to get people there, which means interacting with social or search and advertising. And those tie really close into your content development. Jessica mentioned it earlier, you know, having a lot of content. One of the things we espouse a lot of times at Clutch is, you know, if you can build sort of a couple of foundational big content pieces that you can keep pulling from and you repurposing in a lot of different ways, super helpful for you to just be really efficient in that, um, in that process that can get really time consuming. And then you've got a website, certainly you want to sell. And that might be selling through your own website. That might be selling through somebody else's website and thinking through all the considerations of, is it a shopping cart on your site? Is it a, you know, using somebody else's um, environment? And, and ultimately, if you're using their environment, how are you getting the product to the end consumer once that consumer is ordered? So um, let's hop to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about just kind of starting with website. You know, I think it's the easy place to start. You know, most companies have a website, but I think the thing that we started to go through was like, what's the why? Why do you actually have a website? And, you know, there's a handful of things and reasons why you would. Telling that brand story, just providing product information, right? A lot of food brands that are well known, you know, like if I think about the big CPGs I work for, there's probably not a lot of reason, honestly, to come to that website beyond getting information. Um, for a website as yourself, you might want to collect information from consumers, from consumers. And then the opportunity to promote and also the opportunity to sell on your website. Um, you know, but I think telling a brand story, particularly for smaller scale businesses, is, um, is really one of those good opportunities in terms of, you know, sharing what the mission or the vision is of the organization, why it fits into their consumers' lives, you know, what sort of a, a solution you believe that it's, that it's offering for them. Um, you know, Within the guide, again, like we, we talk a little bit about positioning. We won't get into that here because that's, you know, again, that's sort of the foundation of telling your brand story. Um, but we're also highlighting the guide. There's seven companies in there that we think did a really nice job of telling their brand story in their website. And so as you go through the guide, definitely click through those companies and go and experience kind of how they've taken that idea to, um, to the consumers. Let's hop on to the next page. Um, so obviously you've, you've you know, you've started the website, maybe you potentially hopped on Wix or web.com and you, you know, you got your URL. A um, lot of support resources out there in terms of highlighting those folks that, uh, that ultimately can help you build out that website and maintain that website from, um, you know, copywriters to developers to graphic designers. Um, you know, depending on your environment, you may need to use these folks or you may not need to use these folks, right? If, if you've got some decent photography, you might be able to be doing something um, fully by yourself, or you might be in something that's more complex and you want a fully developed, um, fully developed website that fully professionally designed. And, and so that, that sort of conversation kind of goes hand in hand with, um, that platform decision. Are you doing something that is purely DIY, like with a, a Wix or a Squarespace? Are you doing something that's kind of in the middle with a WordPress that doesn't take what I'd consider a lot of programming capabilities, but it takes a little bit more than the, the pure WYSIWYG um, builders like a Wix or a web.com, or do you go off and are you 100% from scratch, you've got a different concept and, and you want it built you know, off of template, if you will, in which case um, you know, some of these resources are gonna be more, more valuable to, to you in terms of you know, sort of building your team, assembling your team that helps you from an online perspective. Um, in the guide, we don't specifically point out individual resources, but what we have done is we've included a number of links to resources where you can get some guidance to actually find folks, whether it's the, the Grow North and the Forge uh, North database, uh, the Department of Ag, uh, the Public Relations Society of America has a nice resource uh, listing of folks that work in their space, as well as the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. And there's a couple others on there. And so um, those are, um, those are some uh, basically opportunities to find the right sort of folks uh, to help you through the through the website or, or, sort of, or through website building or through social uh, social channel building. Um, Jason, why don't we hop to the next website or what next slide? So 
starting with the, the website, obviously you've kind of got that as the core. The other side of this thing is really looking at digital marketing opportunities. And, and I think, you know, one, one fault that a lot of folks likely have is sort of looking at it all and kind of thinking it all about, about sort of e-commerce or, or online digital marketing as um, all is social, social networking and, and all is social. And in reality, it is, you know, a lot of different things kind of going on there. You've got the pure social channel, right? Like a Facebook and a LinkedIn, but then you've got something like Pinterest that are purely, um, uh, they're search engines at the end of the day, right? One for curating videos and one for curating images, but ultimately folks aren't going there and having conversations. They're looking for information the same way they'd look for information on a Google. It's just that it's coming back to them in a little bit of a different form. Um, and so when you're working with any of these um, digital marketing tools, we think about um, wanting to use, you know, use the right tool at the right time in terms of if you're trying to announce events, you know, they make sense in some of that social space. They might make sense in some microblogging space. They don't necessarily make sense in search engines. Um, and so, you know, I think having context for what each of those channels is meant to do is important as you think about how you're communicating to folks. A um, few other best practices, right? Start small, kind of do it, do less, but do it well and adopt a test and learn mentality. All of those kind of go hand in hand in terms of, um, you know, you can sink entire days into working on, e on, on digital marketing or into, into your social channels. It, find out what works, you know, repurpose content, try and keep, keep consistent and, um, and invest slowly to make sure that you're not spending all of your resources as you're, as you're particularly if you're scaling and you're doing a lot of different things uh, in a business to, you know, make sure you're getting an ROI for your time at the end of the day. Um, be regular when you're on those channels. Obviously that, that helps you just show up and be, you know, be there for folks. And then, you know, we really push for striving, you know, consistency and in, in being genuine across the course of, you know, be who you are, be consistent in the voice and the visual so that folks are, are expecting to see a certain sort of thing from you, whether it's your visual content, whether it's, you know, how you come across in a video. Um, make that consistent. It helps to build your brand um, and, and uh, ultimately, you know, creates, creates opportunity for you long term. Jason, what's up in the next slide? So the third piece of this, this puzzle was, um, was e-commerce, right? And thinking about getting online and actually selling the product. If you've got the, um, you know, if you've got the website, if you've done some of the stuff you want to sell, there's really kind of two channels that we think about. You know, the first is that website storefront that you might be hosting on your own site. And there's a lot of considerations there to think about as it relates to, um, you know, getting online. One is, you know, product assortment. Are you going to offer the same product that you offer in brick and mortar? Are you going to offer something different? Might you require bundles to try and provide a different, um, a different benefit or a different opportunity for folks to buy and sort of create some insulation from your, from your brick and mortar uh, partners? Pricing, you know, um, generally good advice. Brick and mortar stores aren't going to want to be undercut versus what they can buy, you know, what you can sell online for. Being conscious of that to make sure that you're, you know, you've got sort of a fair pricing uh, scheme across all channels. Quantity requirements, do you know, you do have to have minimum quantities in order to, um, to make shipping it uh, useful and valuable and profitable to you as a business. Um, informing those decisions and enabling transactions. Are you giving the folks the right information they need to buy a product on your store? You know, whether it is recipes or varieties or nutrition information, making sure all of that is there. And then ultimately, how are you going to get it to, how are you going to get it to that consumer? Thinking about who's shipping it. Are you using a third party to do that? Are you doing it yourself, literally boxing stuff up? Um, and then shopping cart considerations as well, where you've got to be thinking through, you know, what is the, um, what is the shopping cart that you're going to put on your site? How does that interact with your website? Again, there's a lot that are, um, a lot of shopping carts out there will interface with a lot of the different website builders pretty seamlessly, but they all have different um, options. And so working through, um, working through each or, or thinking through what tool you're using to, to make that happen is, is important. And we go through in the, in the document, kind of highlighting a few of the key, um, key partners in that regard or, or pure key sort of choices that you have in that regard. Um, what's up in the next slide? So the other 
sort of the second option, and it's a myriad of options really, he is if you're not going to do it on your website, and you may choose to do both website, but the, op the other opportunity is third party and, and working through someone else. You know, Amazon's the obvious big one, right? And it's, it's a huge opportunity. And there's, there's a lot of considerations that go into how you interact with, with Amazon, whether they are, uh, as, as, as Jessica mentioned, um, you know, having your own storefront versus just having individual products listed there and sort of selling through other people within Amazon. And how is that fulfillment happening? Is it happening through them as a, as uh, they're providing that service or through you and thinking about the cost considerations of that as, um, you know, th there are certain fees that are tied to them fulfilling versus you fulfilling and different cost structure and doing the math behind that is, is an important factor. Um, there's a number of other brick and mortar like marketplaces that are kind of emulating that uh, that Amazon experience, but tied to typical brick and mortar stores. Um, Walmart Marketplace, Target Plus, Albertsons, they all have marketplaces that are not necessarily there, you know, like a target.com experience, but it's expanded to that to a lot of other folks who are selling almost as a third party, not tied into the, um, not tied into the, the, call it the online for that store itself, where they'd be saying, looking at the exact same assortment that you might find in the store. This is assortment that's outside of that environment. Um, there's category specific and some unique opportunities out there as well. And depending on the size of your business, it's worth looking into a lot of these opportunities. You know, category specific, if you think about food service, there are retail merchants out there, um, you know, web restaurant store, food service direct, who are only selling things to individual restaurant operators, small chains and folks like that. If you've got a product that is sort of food service directed to begin with, finding opportunities and, and finding partners or looking for partners there is, is uh, really an important opportunity. Um, as well as, you know, some categories or some regional opportunities which we've kind of just got highlight a few that we we talk about in the uh, in the module here, you know, Barn to Door, Gray's Card, Harvey. A lot of these tend to be aimed at you know regional uh, small entrepreneurs, cottage industry makers, that sort of thing, um, or small um, you know maybe produce or meat product companies, um, more perishable things. And looking for ways to connect these folks direct to consumers or to other small retailers um, to help build their business um, sort of outside that traditional grocery environment. And Jason, let's hop on to the, uh, the next slide and just kind of wrapping up here, you know, regardless of which way you, um, you know, which way you decide to go to market, whether it's through your own, um, through your own website or through a a retail partner, an online retail partner, it's important to think about just how that product is getting to market and what are the considerations from a business perspective, both from, you know, from an inventory perspective, a, a cost, uh, a time perspective. Um, you know, so if you think about the typical brick and mortar distribution model, I mean, it's fairly straightforward and fairly linear, right? You start as a manufacturer, you're moving things to a warehouse or maybe a wholesaler as a step towards the retailer, where ultimately the consumer buys the product. But you know, it's all a very linear flow and, and uh, sort of inventory and paperwork are kind of all flowing at the same, the same direction and the same pace, if you will. Versus when you get into that online distribution model, things can get a little bit more complex because, you know, rather than necessarily just being almost a little bit of a push, that consumer gets involved here in almost a bit of a circular mentality where, you know, they may be ordering and that order may be grabbing something out of a warehouse. Um, that ultimately then is picked for the order and shipped and, and sent to that consumer. Um, again, it, it gets into just considerations that you need to think about as a, as a growing business as to, you know, if I'm going to use, you know, ultimately who's going to send that product when that order comes in, is it, is it me as the entrepreneur who's going to the warehouse, picking that product and, and packaging it up? Do I have a third party warehouse that is, is holding that inventory and, you know, Kind of pick and pack operation that's going to um, to run that product through and ultimately ship it to the the consumer, or is my retail partner uh, holding that in inventory and and moving that through? And so all of those have different cost considerations, which are worth thinking about. You know, both from a you know from the fees each one of those entities would charge to the time that it takes for you to manage it to. Um, you know, to the inventory and even the cost of essentially having more inventory if you've got it placed in multiple locations, multiple 
warehouses with different retailers versus all having it in a single warehouse at your own own facility where you know where you start to get into some considerations around how much you know how much money you've got potentially tied into inventory to make sure that you can ultimately fulfill those folks um, when they're ready to be purchased um, in a timely manner so um, so a, a number of trade-offs there so I know that was certainly quick and uh, hopefully folks a little bit of a flavor for what the what the module online um, contains and some of the some of the highlights of the information in there I mean at the end of the day it's it's really kind of looking at website the the e e marketing both from a social search and a and a uh, other element and then um, and then the e-commerce considerations and just how you get to market um, with your product and, and thinking about how do you you know how do you sort of recreate what we're all used to offline in that online environment in terms of being able to buy a product and ship it ultimately to the consumer who, who wants it. Great, thanks Dave, appreciate your, uh, your time and uh, for walking us through that, that module. Sure. Uh, for the final part of our webinar today, we're gonna turn it over to Brian Erickson, who'll tell us a little bit more about the specific programs associated with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's cost sharing program and support that they provide to local Minnesota businesses. Brian, on to you. Hi, Jason. Thank you so much. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. As Jason said, I'm Brian Erickson. I manage what's called the New Markets Program at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture in our Ag Marketing and Development Division. Um, we offer different resources that include some web resources, co-packer lists, commercial kitchen lists, uh, starting a food biz, um, roadmap, um, and Nan has posted in the uh, chat our, our uh, URL um, link. So take a peek if you get a chance, I'm gonna be as brief as possible because we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. Uh, we also uh, work at trade shows. We support uh, Minnesota pavilions at different food shows around the country. Um, and then for cost sharing, we provide 50% reimbursement for what we consider high impact marketing activities uh, for things like trade shows and store demos. And then uh, when COVID hit, we did a, a big pivot into digital marketing and e-commerce. Um, and so a lot, of the, a lot of the different types of costs that the previous speakers have been speaking to uh, around platforms and uh, digital marketing um, a lot of those, uh, we will share the costs uh, for those activities. And uh, one thing that we noticed, uh, one of the allowable costs is uh, e-commerce and digital consulting, management fees, and training. And we weren't getting a lot of traction uh, uh, in that category. And we kind of wondered why, because we were hearing from a lot of small food companies that uh, they're really trying to get their arms around this. And it seemed to make sense to us that they would be seeking help for those activities to kind of figure out a strategy to uh, how best approach all of this. And Jason, we could advance to the next slide, please. Um, so, and we also noticed at the same time, uh, this is from a recent survey of our 144 uh, cost share program participants, small food companies and farms in Minnesota that almost all of them um, are participating in e-commerce and online market channels. Um, so we have this group of 150 roughly uh, small food companies and farms that are trying to sell products and, and a large majority of them are, are, um, um, are using that channel uh, along with others of course as well. But um, it's pretty clear to us that uh, this was an important uh, place for us to play and, and support our small food companies' uh, uh, participation. So, uh, and you can advance the next slide again, Jason. Uh, having, having seen uh, the lack of traction in e-commerce kind of consulting and management, we decided to, and I credit uh, MDA leadership for funding this opportunity. Um, uh, we decided to invest in uh, what we call the e-commerce and digital marketing audit pilot program. So it's kind of a trial uh, where we uh, we put out an RFP, a request for proposals, and we used outside grant reviewers who helped us choose two agencies to work with. What we're kind of doing is to create a shortcut to, to uh, working with agencies and consultants in the field of digital and e-commerce. Um, and those uh, uh, agencies that were selected are 
have since worked with us to pick 25 Minnesota farms and food companies to work with uh, to, to bring them through a process that uh, will audit their e-commerce and digital strategy and provide recommendations to them. And also part of that process, those case studies will be posted online on our website uh, to hopefully offer broader support to the, uh, to the community and to other food companies in Minnesota. So that was about all I had this morning. Uh, if you have questions about uh, um, cost sharing and our programs, I encourage you to reach out to us um, anytime. The, the cost sharing program is currently on pause after our last fiscal year. But we're, our goal is to uh, um, offer a similar program again by the end of September with the help of our advisory team, uh, which is made up of small food company founders in Minnesota. So kind of in conclusion, Jason, uh, AURI, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, you guys are a competitive advantage for Minnesota food companies. And I encourage any of those uh, people that benefit from these programs to reach out to your decision makers if you're inclined to do so and, and tell them that uh, you appreciate this support because it doesn't just come out of thin air, um, comes as a result of a lot of support um, starting with uh, that funding. So thank you. Fabulous. Well, thank you, Brian. Appreciate your time as well and all the partnership that uh, AURI experiences with the MDA. Um, with that, the content that we had provided today is, uh, is now complete. We'll turn it back over to Dan for uh, uh, Q&A moderation. But before we get there, I just wanted to highlight that the uh, digital marketing tool that uh, Dave walked us through and the purpose of today's uh, webinar is, uh, once again, it's available at auridigitalmarketing.org or you can access it through the auri.org website if you navigate to the food focus area and um, click on guides. So with that, Dan, I'll turn it back over to you. And thanks again for attending today's webinar Wednesday. All right, Jason, thanks so much. Thanks you uh, also to Brian and Dave and Jessica and uh, just ask them to hang in there a little bit. We do have several questions. We'll get to most of them, I think. Um, and then I've got a couple too, my head swimming just a little bit. Uh, it just seems like there's so many options, but we'll maybe get a chance to talk about that here in the next few minutes. Let's just start right at the beginning and we'll try to get through these questions. I would encourage our panelists to uh, pick up and answer if, uh, if you have uh, something you'd like to uh, say to the questions. How can we as the producers and marketers stay behind the products and services and not be visible to the potential purchasers? If nobody wants to um, tackle, Jessica? I'll kind of chime in. I saw that question. I think maybe what that person is getting at is the, um, you know, just in this day and age, like, do you have to be like the, the face of your brand? Do you have to be out there, you know, kind of as the spokesperson? Um, and that's definitely something that I struggle with. Uh, you know, I don't want the humble nut butter Instagram feed to be, you know, a, a reel of me. I want it to be about the product, but the fact of the matter is people want to know who is behind the product and they want to feel connected to the reason why it was created. So I think for us, it's a balance of making it about the product, but also showing that, you know, we're a women-owned company. We have a little kind of Thursdays with Tim. When Tim is with us, John and Tim will ha have, you know, kind of question and answer sessions that it, it's just a way to kind of communicate and show a little bit of, I guess, the personality behind your brand. Um, that's how I took the question. It just, uh, here's, those, are great, uh, those are great comments. Uh, the only thing I would add is that um, consumers today desire authenticity from their brands. So to be able to put a face to that brand is, is really crucial to, uh, to providing that level of genuineness and authenticity in what you're saying. So I wouldn't hesitate to, uh, to be able to um, associate a brand with you as the founder and the values that you stand for, because that's very crucial to um, establishing an authenticity to the brand that you create today. So. 
and Jessica, I didn't encourage you to go into our Q and A Q&A portal and maybe answer a couple of questions or some people that have just some product questions. And uh, since our intent today is to talk about e-commerce, we'll maybe try to stay on that on that topic. Uh, here's a, a participant who says, "I have a service business that needs to narrow cast to local prospects." I'm not sure if they're asking for some direction in who to engage in that process or uh, do our panelists have uh, uh, some suggestions for them here? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of your online marketing tools enable that really well. So I think about, um, you know, whether it's advertising through Facebook or advertising through LinkedIn, if you happen to be looking for B2B prospects, you know, you can, you can geo-target, you can target by type of business, you know, experience, age, a number of different demographics, employment status, income, things of that nature. And so um, all of those help you really hone in on where you're ultimately able to sell or service if you're, you know, in this case, dealing with a, a local service business. Um, is there, ab you know, is there going to be noise in that? Absolutely. I haven't, I don't think I've ever run a campaign where I don't get some responses that are out of field either because they didn't quite meet meet the, the demographic perfectly or they didn't meet the geography but by and large you know it does a good job of making efficient use of your of your funds using using some of those online tools i think uh, there are several we could group together here squarespace uh mailchimp uh what uh, what is the name of the tool you use to plan your social media posts uh, jessica uh, seemed like uh, rattled off six or seven different uh, platform she was using. Dave, you had a slide up that uh, I think showed six or seven or eight uh, different platforms. Uh, it seems like we have a lot of questions that need to be answered before we start selecting who's going to help us. Yeah, I think there's, well, I, I think there are, you know, in each of the things we talked about today, there's a lot of tools and and quite honestly, a lot of them do, you know, as sort of software as a science companies, they, they do a lot of the same sort of stuff. Right. So Jessica, I forget the social media company you said you used, but I know like in, in the module, we highlighted Hootsuite and, um, oh shoot. Uh, God, which was the other one? No, no, I'm drawing a blank. Um, but ultimately, you know, a couple of different resources in there, those tools literally let you essentially write your posts, point them to where they're going and post them for you on a, a, you know, predetermined time and cadence and, and essentially allow you to rather than have to be there on a daily basis, you know, interact once, once a week, once every couple of weeks and, and essentially be planful about it and let the system handle it on the back end. Um, you know, uh, oh, go ahead. Nick. I was just going to ask Jessica if she could repeat the name of the tool she used. One of our uh, participants today would like to know what you use for your social media posts. Um, we use a platform called Lately Social, and what it does, it, it allows you to kind of pre-type um, maybe a post or your, you know, what the picture that you want to do and put it out at a specific time um, so you don't have to constantly be doing it in the moment. Um, talk a little bit, uh, maybe Dave or Jessica, about your rhythm of business when you're working with uh, Amazon and uh, those fulfillment houses. Yeah, I mean, Jessica, you're probably firsthand probably a better experience with that. I mean, I've got perspective anecdotally, but. Yeah, I mean, I. it's hard to say about a rhythm. Um, we are heading into a time of year that's typically busier for us. And we're also going to be upping our ad spend to increase our placement on the pages. So we anticipate a lot more orders um, the thing to keep in mind with Amazon is you're not fulfilling individual orders. You're fulfilling orders to the Amazon facility. Um, so it's, it's really like a, an online grocery store, <laughs> which is exactly what they are. Um, plus a lot of other things. Um, I, I was, I was really skeptical at first with Amazon because even though I'm a, a big personally Amazon shopper, you know, it's like I get my diapers and all the things and 
paper towels and laundry detergent, but I had never really purchased a lot of food. Um, but it was really like kind of proof is in the pudding and we put it out there. And I think with the pandemic and then the merger with Whole Foods, there is a lot more activity and comfort around ordering food products off of Amazon, I think in the past year, two years. Um, and I think you can make it as big a channel as you want to make it. That said, it is not the most, it, Amazon is an expensive channel to run for us. Um, maybe not all businesses, but I think food products, you know, depending, especially if you have um, something with a short shelf life, it might not be a really great option for you. Or, you know, I, I don't know how they deal with um, refrigerated products of, of that nature. Um, but you, you can kind of make it as big as you want it. I, in some ways, think of Amazon as more of a marketing channel than, than anything else because the margins do get whittled down quite a lot once you add in all of their fee structure when it's fulfilled by Amazon and what it takes to kind of keep up with their search engines and their advertising to make sure that you have a placement on a page that's going to actually result in sales. I hope that I think, answers the question. I think, well, I think we'll piggyback with another question from our participants today. Please address for the participants the importance of protecting margins and the difference from selling on your website and the 7 to 15% referral fee on Amazon, Amazon and the 30 to 50% margin that B and M requires. Is that something uh, these uh, businesses need to be very aware of as they start to move into uh, participation with some of these organizations? For sure. Um, I think, you know, as we've learned, you can never have too much margin in food businesses. Um, and a lot gets, Amazon It can, may not be like the place for everybody. Um, so yeah, you do need to protect your margins. And I think go into any online channel you have eyes wide open and Amazon has good tools that will, you can plug in the weight of your product, the dimensions, and it'll tell you exactly what you will get paid out to the penny per product. Um, so yeah, you, and I think that's true of any channel. I think it's something you should be hyper aware of with, with online marketplaces. Yeah, I think it's the reality, right? That there's a there's a trade-off to the distribution scale that any partner gives you, right? Like the the most margin anybody is going to make as a food entrepreneur is loading up their car and bringing it to the farmer's market, arguably, because they can sell at what, what they believe is a proper retail price. And there's nobody between their manufacturing and selling that to a consumer. You know, the minute you put it on your website, you've got at a bare minimum, some shipping expenses to get it from you to that person. The minute you go to a grocery retailer, yes, they've got a market, you know, they've got a margin structure that they're requiring that eats into your profitability. And, and online is the exact same way. The fees are slightly different and they're organized different, but the reality is to, to be aware of them is critical as you think about essentially setting up your business proposition, you know, to sell product online. Jessica, did you build your own website? And if you did not, uh, how costly was it? I did build my own website. Um, I used Squarespace. So Squarespace, like Wix, has a lot of different templates. Um, and I think Dave mentioned WYSIWYG, which is kind of, it, it's an old term. It, it stands for what you see is what you get. So they have kind of a, a portal where you type in things and it'll show you what it's going to look like displayed on the website. So it's really doing the code behind the scenes for you. I think if you've ever done a PowerPoint presentation, you can build a website um, through, through those tools, through Squarespace and Wix. A uh, question here, if, you, uh, if we need to hire a web designer, how do we find a designer who is smart enough for our business type and our mission? What's, what's the secret sauce to get the right person in 
in, included in your business? No, I think for me, and whether it's a web designer or it's any, frankly, one of those resources that we talked about um, is, you know, number one, networking with folks to understand who they've used. You know, we've, we've got on, in the portal or, or in the module, a number of links to some databases that will point you to some resources. They're, they're not all inclusive by any means. So talking to other entrepreneurs is a great way to find it. But I think it is important to be conscious of, you know, the type of work they're doing. As, as you go to see their work, I mean, don't be enamored by necessarily, you know, some of the bells and whistles. I mean, be thinking about, are they in your industry? You know, are they, are they working with food? Are they working with small food companies that, um, you know, so that they've got an appreciation for, you know, whether it's the sort of resources you've got, the sophistication you might have, um, you know, the, the fact that you might be much more mission driven than a larger company who is more P&L driven potentially. Um, and so I think um, that networking and, and, you know, really looking at their resources and their, their portfolio of work is, is the best advice I can give. Brian, if I would, I... real quick, Dan, oh. I, would just, I would just add uh, to that comment, Dave, that expect to put in some work uh, to bring that web designer up to speed with your mission and, and how you're managing the, uh, the brand itself, because these are external organizations that are trying to come in and, and capture the essence of what your brand is about. Uh, so this is not a situation where you can sign a contract and uh, let them do their thing and, and hope to get the results you expect without putting in the effort yourself to clearly identify the values, the mission, um, the point of, of the brand that you're trying to sell online. So that's just wanted to make that final point. Sorry, Dan, to interrupt. That's all right, Brian. I just did want to ask uh, from the department's perspective, uh, is there a checklist on uh, online that uh, these uh, food uh, uh, producers should go to and they can kind of see what ne needs to be done or uh, what is your advice to them as they get ready to start this process? Um, yeah, no, it's a little bit of a, a sticky wicket for us to uh, have resources online that are private companies, of course, because we're state agency. But uh, I will say that some of the more common investments that are made through our cost share program include things like Shopify, you know, web design, um, photography and vi videography. Uh, what else? Let's see. Constant Contact, um, Clavio, MailChimp, Fair, um, and then Amazon, of course, Amazon fees. And then people tend to advertise on Facebook extensively as well. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of pieces there. I think one other consideration that uh, new makers should should think about all the time though, is, is uh, the, the data that they're getting from those platforms. Um, if you're gonna tell your story, you need to have ownership of those email addresses and it's never too early to start collecting them and, and, uh, and, and finding ways to, to provide value to those, to those uh, buyers because you, you're gonna have to build your own audience um, organically for the most part. And, Amazon is not going to provide that data to you, so uh, find other ways to collect collect uh, supporters and uh, and uh, find ways to support them. It just sounds like with all the information that was kind of brought to us today, uh, the department's web page or the department itself may be able to kind of help uh, somebody who's new to it filter through uh, and find actually what they need. Just. Yeah, I mean, the topic is super broad. And of course, this uh, platform that you're building in AURI is going to be a big help. Uh, and I'm always happy to talk to people if they have questions. But uh, for now, uh, we do have a, a resource that's uh, designed to walk people through. It's called the Roadmap for Starting a Food Business. Uh, it was it developed with a bunch of partners in Minnesota. So it's a good place to start. And then, of course, resources available at uh, at Grow North, and you know, as far as networking goes, to find find some of these resources, uh, Food Ag Ideas Week is coming up next month already. Great place to start. I would encourage everybody to sign up for all those events and and attend. And th thanks, thanks, Brian, for those comments. And, and Jason and Dave, maybe maybe you've got the checklist in your report too. Uh, you know, maybe there's other ways, other places to go and find that information that these people need. Mm -hmm. yeah, the internet is a wonderful tool. 
<laughs> a couple more questions. We'll let everybody go. How does a service business narrow cast to eligible prospects in the service range? If it involves driving to the right uh, to the site, I guess uh, is what they put in parentheses. Not quite sure what they're asking there. All right, let's move on to is narrow casting from social networking, LinkedIn and Facebook and microblogging, Twitter and Tumblr and Pinterest feasible. If we're mining for prospects for a labor intensive service, can those digital online media be worth the energy investment? I, you know, I really think they are. I mean, this, this question around narrow casting just in general, I mean, the tools are, they're designed to be fairly precise and efficient for small operators, right? I mean, there are, there are massive companies advertising on every one of those social channels. And there are very small organizations that have a, you know, a limited audience, whether that audience is limited by geography or limited by background, you know, income, whatever their specific need is. Um, and the tools are, you know, they're efficient. You might be paying as little as, you know, 50 cents to a, you know, 50 cents to a dollar for a contact. Um, you know, through, I'm just thinking like um, LinkedIn specifically, right? And, and even less when you get to, what to, where you get to Facebook where the, some of the, um, the targeting might be not quite as precise. And so, um, yeah, you absolutely can be efficient. I mean, there's a lot that obviously goes into being successful within that in terms of, you know, the, the reach doesn't necessarily cost you a whole lot, but you've obviously got to have a compelling message and ultimately a compelling value proposition for that reach to turn into a contact, a call, the ability to close a deal. Very good. Presenters and uh, Jason, I think we'll leave it there. Dave and uh, Brian, Jessica, Jason, thank you very much for your time today and uh, very uh, informative and uh, appreciate uh, everything that was shared here today. And that does conclude AURI Connect's webinar Wednesday for today. We do wanna thank our presenters and panelists AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday is uh, presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products and processes. We're interested in your feedback, so please respond when we send you our event evaluations. And remember that for more information on today's program or any of the work that AURI is involved with, you can go to auri.org. Now, next month on October 13th, please tune in to AURI's next webinar Wednesday, where you can learn about new educational and technical opportunities for meat processing and slaughter, as well as an exciting mobile meat slaughter grant opportunity that AURI will be administering for the state of Minnesota. And you can always learn more about other work that AURI is involved in, with by going online to auri.org. And we're looking forward to having you join us again October 13th for another AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday.